my next speaker is Dr. Anusha. All of us are familiar with her uh, reporting. So she has done her uh, MD from uh, Mamsi Delhi and one year of PDF from uh, uh, Nimans. So after that she was working as assistant professor in uh, KMC and now she is starting a new innings as a consultant neuropathologist in First Year Hospital. So uh, she also happens to be my wife. kind introduction. Uh, I know I'm standing between you all and the dinner, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, so, my topic would be muscle and nerve biopsy, what we expect and what is expected out of us. So, the first thing that we would want is a good sample. So, let us see what muscle is to be biopsy, at least for us to tell, give you a definitive diagnosis. How much of the muscle is required for us? Uh, how should it reach and by when it should reach the lab? First thing, it has to be the involved muscle. Uh, if it is not the involved muscle, we will, uh, I think you would see our reports as no diagnostic pathology. So that would be the standard statement if it is not the involved muscle. And the power has to be at least uh, 3, if it is, or 4 minus at the max, not 4 plus and 5, or nothing less than 3. If needed, MRI guidance is to be taken and this is especially in case of inflammatory myopathies or the myositis because of the patchy involvement of the muscle. If a random biopsy is taken, that particular segment may not be actually uh, representative of the lesion. And we would prefer an open biopsy, uh, uh, preferred over the needle biopsy just because we get more tissue so we can actually examine more surface area and we can do more tests. So, you might be wondering what happens, why am I so, uh, I'm telling that it has to be uh, 3 by 5 or 4 minus and not uh, 3 or 5, less than 3 or 5. So, this is what happens if it is less than 3. Uh, any disease causing uh, the power to be less than 3, what happens is there is destruction of the muscle fibers. So, when there is destruction of any tissue, our body actually tries to replace it by fibrous tissue or the fat. So, we have the fatty infiltration with few big fibers and the small fibers. So ultimately the report would state as advanced muscle disease. We will not be able to tell you did muscular dystrophy cause this? Maybe. Neurogenic uh, disease cause this? Maybe. Is it chronic inflammatory myopathy? Maybe. So we will not be able to delineate as to what caused this if it is less than 3 by 5. And if it is 5 by 5, this is how a normal muscle looks. So all the fascicular architecture is maintained, it is polygonal, nice looking, so we will actually tell no diagnostic pathology on this. That's why we require the involved muscle and at least 4 minus of the 3 by 5 power. Now amount of muscle to be sent, uh, it depends upon what are the tests that are being uh, performed on the muscle. So what exactly can be done is, if it is a fresh muscle, we can do cryo freezing following which we can do enzyme hysterochemistry and immunohysterochemistry. The same tissue, if it is sent fair, fresh, we can even actually fix it in formalin or glutaraldehyde after, uh, after some time, after taking it for the cryo. And we can examine transverse section and longitudinal sections. Now, now when we do cryo freezing, we just see the transverse section, we do not see the longitudinal section. When we tell trans section, we, uh, transverse section, we are just seeing the cross section. So it's only at one section that you're seeing. You're not seeing the entire length of the muscles, which may be required in some cases. So in cryo, we'll be seeing only transverse section. So that is why it is actually complemented uh, with fixing in formalin and then examining uh, so that we see the uh, longer length of the muscle. And if needed, like if it is a case like congenital myopathy, like nevalin rod, so electron microscopy may be required, so we can keep a tissue aside for electron microscopy which can be taken up later. So at least 2 into 1 centimeter muscle is a must. We do not require a big chunk of tissue, but we don't expect even 0.5 alone because we can just do the cryo then. We cannot be doing the further testings. Now how should the muscle reach the lab? Again depends upon whether Enzyme histochemistry or immunohistochemistry is required or is it only the histomorphological analysis? So if it is enzyme histochemistry and IHC, it requires fresh sample to be sent, fresh muscle biopsy because we are going to cryo freeze it using liquid nitrogen. This is done at minus 70 degrees. The freezing happens at minus 70 degrees uh, centigrade and this should not have any fixative. 
not even a vapor of formalin has to come in contact with the muscle because the enzymes are really really sensitive to the formalin even a little uh, vapor of formalin can actually give false negative results so when uh, when we get the sample for uh, the cryo muscle biopsy we actually uh, expect it in some some uh, way the way is that the muscle biopsy has to be placed on the gauze and the gauze has to be just moistened we need only one or two drop of saline over it not it should not be soaking in saline so please do not soak the gauze the gauze in the saline and this has to be put in the airtight container again without any fixative and has to reach the lab immediately now immediately uh, when i tell it may not be possible in all the cases there may be some amount of delay so it can uh, reach the lab within 12 hours of the biopsy if the following conditions are uh, met with so it has to be placed on the gauze again just moistened with the normal saline it is just to keep the muscle biopsy moist uh, not letting it dry and this has to be put in a polythene air tight polythene without any fixative and this container has to be put in a thermo flask containing ice and the thing that you have to make sure is the ice water it is airtight and the ice water do not enter this packet of the container because once the water enters the container it is going to soak along with the gauze it is going to soak the muzzle as well so this is how this is one of from one of the article from nimans itself as to how the biopsy has to be set so it is to be placed on the gauze uh, which is moistened with the normal saline packed in a airtight polythene put it in a uh, thermos flask containing ice water again which is airtight and then sent to the lab so the maximum that can uh, that we can actually get within is 12 hours beyond that what happens is like any other tissue which you keep outside it is going to go for enzyme degradation and hence autolysis so we will not be able to do most of the test and give you a definitive result Now, since I'm telling so many uh, times that it should not be soaked in saline, let me show you what exactly happens if the tissue is soaked in saline. So, uh, you all know that the ice actually becomes ice. I mean, the water becomes ice if it is below zero. That exactly happens here because we are putting it into minus seventy. So, this is how we can see small holes. If it is this small, maybe we can still help you out with the diagnosis. but this will interfere with our uh, interpretation because when you talk of metabolic myopathies the lipid storage disorder this is exactly how it is going to look so that is one place where it causes lot of confusion and especially if you had kept it in the refrigerator and then put it in the saline so we can't even do oil red to tell that this is lipid storage so this will uh, remain as the artifact now the problem comes when we have bigger holes so when we are doing enzyme histochemistry many of the times we are uh, trying to see the organization of the mitochondria and the tt groups now this crystal itself will cause disorganization of the mitochondria and the sarcoplasmic tt groups and hence the whatever interpretation we get out of the enzyme histochemistry we don't know whether it is artifactual or factual so this is uh, the problem that we face uh, if it is not uh, uh, actually sent as per uh, recommendation now if it is muscle biopsy uh, to be sent in fixative only for histomorphological analysis 2.5% lipoaldehyde is preferred over 10% formalin and uh, we still prefer that cydex not to be used uh, because it is activated lipoaldehyde we do not want that we just want the plain 2.5% lipoaldehyde the only disadvantage the, actually the main disadvantage would be enzyme histochemistry and ihc for any other reasons cannot be done on this it is just the morphological analysis so we cannot tell whether there is uh, what type of muscular dystrophy it is or whether there is neurogenic changes we cannot uh, help you out with that now that was specimen is specimen alone enough not at all you would uh, actually if uh, you have sent this biopsy to me all of you would have known that i keep calling for uh, the clinical history so we require a complete clinical details with respect to onset progression group of muscle involved or any conspicuous sparing or any uh, any feature that stand out so age at onset whether it is congenital uh, like we have congenital myopathies which uh, occur at the stage of infancy itself like a floppy infant syndrome even the severe metabolic myopathies can present uh, at the infancy whether it is childhood uh, disease um the duchenne's presence in the childhood that gives us a hint as to where what test we should be anticipating to be done 
or whether it is adult onset. Group of muscle involved, whether it is neck flexor, extensor, whether it is proximal group of muscles like inflammatory myopathies and the muscular dystrophies usually involve the proximal group of muscles. However, uh, the mitochondrial myopathies will cause ocular muscle involvement or the distal group of muscle like the finger movements or finger flexor involvement. This is characteristically told for the sporadic inclusion body myositis. However, it can be even seen in myoclonic dystrophies uh, or sarcoid myopathies or amyloid my or myopathies. Any limb girdle involvement will tell us, uh, will point towards the limb girdle dystrophy. We would also like to know any unique findings, whether there was second wind uh, phenomenon like we see in McArdles, out of wind phenomenon or any symptoms which actually precipitate following fasting. This will tell us whether we have to do PAS stain, whether we should do oil red stain, what exactly we can go ahead with. Any family history, any family member affected like in Duchenne's, we all know that it's X-linked. So we would like to know any family member uh, affected with this. Mm -hmm. or any, any in utero death of any sibling, uh, siblings, especially for the congenital myopathies like mammalian rot, usually there is a history of the previous uh, pregnancy and I think with the in utero death. So this, in, in, in addition with this uh, infant being uh, floppy, then we actually think of the congenital myopathies. So other investigations, we may have to do MRI uh, for of the brain or MRI of the muscles to see the changes in the affected muscle as in cases of uh, inflammatory myopathy. Then we have myositis antibody profiling now. Uh, a point about myositis antibody profiling, why we want to know this is, presently, uh, like in 1875, Gohan Peter came up with the classification of uh, inflammatory myopathies, told that we have uh, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, uh, inclusion body myositis and Juvenile dermatomyositis. But if you take the classification today, the ACR ULA criteria tells altogether a different story. We have antisynthetase syndrome, amyopathic dermatomyositis, adermatopathic dermatomyositis, all based on the presence of the antibodies. So for that, we would like to know because if there are certain subtle features, then with the presence of this antibody, we can actually help you out with a definitive diagnosis. Same with the vasculitis profile, we would like to know whether it is a systemic involvement or an isolated muscle involvement. So the importance of the clinical history and other investigation basically is to guide us as to what further tests are to be done on the muscle biopsy. Before that, let me tell you, if you give us the fresh muscle, what are the stains that we are going to perform? So one would be H and E of the hematoxylin and leucine, the classic pink and the uh, purple color that you see. So that is our H and E, that will be done. Apart from that, we do MGD, which is known as the modified gomery stridome. This stains the mitochondria. So any mitochondrial disorder you want us to diagnose, we would want to do this. The only problem with this stain is, if there was formalin exposure of the tissue, this stain will not work. This is very sensitive to formalin. Even a little of vapor coming in contact with the biopsy, this stain will never work. So not only uh, the mitochondrial uh, myopathy, in the mitochondrial myopathy, you can see here it is like a ragged red fibers. These are the ragged red fibers. Not only for the mitochondrial uh, myopathies, it can also uh, be used to identify the nemelin rods in nemelin uh, uh, rod myopathy, as well as rimmed vacuoles, as we see in vacuolar myopathies or the sporadic inclusion myopathy. Uh, Inclusion body myositis. Next thing would be NADH and the SDH. This stains not only mitochondria, this also stains the T tubules. And uh, normally, this is how it has to look. Check about fat and uh, top. It is like alternating dark and uh, light colored fibers. Dark fibers being the type 1 and light 1 being the type 2. So, one, since it stains the mitochondria, it still helps us to identify the mitochondrial uh, myopathies in the form of ragged blue fibers. Apart from that, we have the cores for the central core myopathies, target fibers as we see in the neurogenic fibers and also when we talk of neurogenic we, uh, diseases, we want to see grouping where denervation has occurred and re has occurred. So the whole group of muscle will be actually supplied by only one type of nerve. So these are nothing but the cores. You can see central area of uh, clearing. So these are the central core myopathy. This is the lobulated fibers which are showing uh, the lobulation on NADH and in this you can see there is this small group of muscle which are all type 1 
and this bigger one is all type 2. So this is the grouping which happens in the neurogenic diseases. Then along with that we do something called COX SDH which uh, identifies the mitochondrial activity, the oxidative phosphorylation part. So if we are going to identify COX deficient fibers, it indicates mitochondrial disorders. This is where uh, the patient's age matters to us most. If we see 2% of uh, COX deficient fiber, then it is considered normal. But if the age of the patient is above uh, 50, then 5% of it is normal. So if you don't write us the age and we see only 2%, then it is still normal. If you don't write and it was 50, then there is a difference in how we actually interpret this. The further tests, these were the normally done tests. The further tests that are dictated are by the history and the histological findings. Now, if your history is giving, uh, pointing towards the metabolic myopathies and we are seeing vacuoles on histopathology, then we go ahead with PARS and oil redo. This is one of the examples where normally this has to be the findings where only tiny dots of red has to be present. However, we, we can see here a lot of fibers with, if you see the inset, it's like a big uh, blob of red color. So this is where lipid storage diseases look like. Not only the special stains, we also do uh, IHC depending upon the features. So this is how the normal uh, dystrophin IHC looks, if it is normal. The left side picture shows if it's Duchenne's, then there will be complete absence of the antibody on state. However, if it is Becker's, we will have only redu reduction but not complete absence. IHC is not required only for the muscular dystrophies, it's also for the inflammatory uh, myopathies. So how can it help? Uh, Especially, it will help especially when we don't have any inflammation throughout the biopsy but you still feel it is inflammatory my myopathy then what we can do is MSC class 1 molecules uh, invariably is upregulated in these and we have something called if there are only few uh, scattered necrotic fibers what we can do is we can do uh, membrane attack complex IHC so that will be deposited over the necrotic fibers like this this will indicate that it was a complement mediated activity and hence it was inflammatory myopathy now that was uh, mainly about the uh, muscle biopsy. So talking about how the nerve has to reach us. Again, we want sample with a complete clinical history. Now what is the ideal length of the nerve that we require? It is at least 2.5 to 3 cm. If you give us only 0.5, we can just see one transverse section, that's it. We are not going to see, you know, uh, more cross sections we cannot have. We can't see the uh, longitudinal sections. So it's a little difficult. The most commonly done is the sural nerve biopsy and others depending upon uh, if it is upper limb involvement, dorsal cutaneous branch of ulnar nerve or the radial nerve can be taken. Now again this has to be fixed immediately in 2.5% glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is preferred over formalin. In glutaraldehyde if it's not available, yes 10% formalin can be still used but never send a normal saline. Now why we tell glutaraldehyde is preferred over formalin is if at all there comes a need that we have to keep a, a bit uh, uh, aside for electron microscopy. If you keep it in formalin, it ends up with formalin artifacts uh, when they examine under the electron microscopy. So it is always better to put it in glutaraldehyde. Again, once the biopsy is done, the biopsy, uh, no biopsy should not be pressed hard because it will lead to pinch artifacts which will actually push the myelin and a big blob of myelin will be seen in one of the cross section which we don't know whether to consider it, uh, consider it as you know the axonal injury or a artifactual one and do not tie the ends of the biopsy nerve to a glass slide it will actually pull the uh, nerve when you are tying it now all this uh, was explained because we divide the nerve and process it as TS and LS now why do we do this? TS actually helps us visualize the fascicles, the amount of fibrosis, how are the myelinated fibers present and is there a loss. Whereas LS visualizes the length of the nerve, the longer length of the nerve and hence any pathology that may be segmented. Apart from TS and LS, we actually process uh, another bit separately and uh, do a stain called kulchitsky pal stain which is used for identification of the myelinated fibers. 
So in cases of suspected hereditary neuropathies, HSAN or NCL or many other hereditary conditions, a bit may be stored in glutaral dehyde so that EM may be performed at a later stage. So this is uh, what I told about the ear. So you can see the fascicle, you can see whether it is normal, enlarged. You can see the vessels in the epineurium, any pathology in that. This will be the LS which we are seeing the, uh, how the axillary arrangement is there, any problems. Uh, and as a, uh, if there is acute uh, axillary injury, then there will be myelin ovoids. That can be easily identified on the uh, longitudinal section. This is the Kulchiski pal stain, uh, which if you see the black rings here, these are the myelin rings. So if it is completely filled and it is normal, here actually it is pathological where you can see pockets of loss. So this is how we actually identify what is the loss and how is the loss. Again, along with the sample, we expect clinical history with respect to onset and progression, duration, type of involvement, sensory, motor, autonomic, because if you tell it is pure motor, then the sural nerve may not show anything. Any family history, any exposure to toxins, possible nutritional deficiency with relevant investigations, because if you tell is it B12 deficiency and if it is showing acute axonal injury, uh, acute degeneration what we say, is it possible with B12 deficiency? Yes. But unless you give the value that there is a deficiency, we cannot confirmly tell that this is deficiency. Any associated comorbidities like diabetes, renal diseases or connective tissue disorders is a must. Also, this applies for both the nerve as well as the muscle and I think even to the CNS tumor tissues, never send two separate biopsy to two separate labs. The problem is, see the pathologies can present as chiflations. So what happens is you send two biopsy, one bit had the pathology, one bit had nothing. So one, one biopsy will report that this is so and so and the other uh, lab will report it as no diagnostic pathology. So it is not the mistake of the pathologist, it is the mistake of the tissue that was sent. So instead rather send one biopsy, get a second opinion sending the same biopsy to elsewhere. So that is one request uh, we all pathologists have. And this did happen once we had two no biopsies, luckily sent to us itself. One biopsy had frank vasculitis, the other bit, except for the myelinated fiber loss, nothing else. So if I had got that, I would have told chronic non-uniform axonopathy or the demyelinating neuropathy, that's it. But since the vasculitis was present in the another bit, so it was vasculitic neuropathy as a diagnosis. Now what is expected of us? If I take a survey, I am sure first thing would come as we need definitive diagnosis. We do not want blanket terms, we do not want generalized terms. And the second answer would be we want early reports. I am sure that is how it would go. So is it possible in all the cases? Yes, it is possible in many of the cases to give definitive diagnosis, but always no. We cannot guarantee that it will be 100% possible. So let's see some of the examples. So now this is an nerve biopsy in a case with mononeuritis multiplex. So these are the fascicles of the nerves. This is ideally a vessel. Now if you see the vessel, there is destruction of the vessel wall with fibrin-like pink material being present. This is nothing but the fibrinoid necrosis and surrounding you have a lot of inflammation. So this is actually vasculitis happening, frank vasculitis that is happening. This was another case that we had, uh, in fact this had fibroid necrosis as well as few of the uh, eosinophil. This actually belonged to Chuck Strauss syndrome because there was uh, eosinophilic degranulation, tissue destruction by eosinophil along with that the clinical criteria is met. We have six criteria out of which at least four have to be met. This met all those and that became the Chuck Strauss syndrome. So, can I give a definitive diagnosis? Absolutely. I can give it as vasculitic neuropathy. Now this is another case where uh, the patient came with autonomic nervous system involvement. Now this is a LS that we are seeing. So if you see there is some blob of pink here. What we call, call as dense, amorphous density which is extracellular. This is another close up picture. So we do a congruent stain because uh, the history told autonomic nervous involvement. So this is how it appears, uh, salmon pink light and then under the polarizing microscopy we see the characteristic apple green bifringens. So can I give a definitive diagnosis? Yes, amyloidotic neuropathy. Now once we give amyloid, uh, the next 
step has to be find out whether the patient has myeloma or is it hereditary. Uh, that is the two things that has to be ruled out. Is it myeloma or hereditary? This is another case where you can see the fascicles are enlarged. You can see this is a smaller fascicle, this is a larger fascicle. And you can see a lot of inflammation here. Something like a foamy, foamy like. And once we did the fight for acoustic, it is all positive for the lepra bacilli. And there is almost complete loss of myelinated fibers. So can a definitive diagnosis be given? Absolutely. We give it as Hansen's disease. The important point is currently, uh, what is told us, previously what was that is if a single nerve is involved, consider it posibacillary, treat it as posibacillary. The current theory is that just uh, if you do a nerve biopsy and if it is showing lepromatous leprosy, don't go by the uh, statement that it is posibacillary, treat it for what the histopathology is telling. So it is very important that we identify and actually categorize as whether it is lepromatous or tuberculoid. So here again, I am sure I will be happy to give this diagnosis. Neurologist is very happy because there is a definitive diagnosis. Coming to the muscle, patient came with the clinical features of CPO. The muscle biopsy showed ragged red fibers. Histopathology is mitochondrial myopathy consistent with CPO. Both of us are very happy. Now that was where we could give a definitive diagnosis. Now what about these cases? Now this is a muscle biopsy where it is showing lot of necrosis, myophagocytosis here. Apart from that, nothing else. So all I can call, uh, I mean tell this as is nec necrotizing myopathy. So if you ask me what exactly caused this, we have lot of causes. It can be toxic, it can be metabolic, it can be drug abuse like statins, or it can be even immune mediated necrotizing myopathy as per the new entity. So how do we actually you know, give a definitive diagnosis. Now, rhabdomyolysis per se has many etiologies. So, we depend on you for that. You tell us whether there was exposure to toxin, whether there is a drug intake, statin intake for many years, or any history, symptoms of metabolic myopathies, or presence of anti-SRP antibodies on myositis antibody profiling. Then we can tell, yes, this is this. So, your history thus helps us to give you a definitive diagnosis. Otherwise, we put a blanket term, necrotizing myopathy, you decide on your own. So, instead we can actually tell with your history, this is compatible with this. Another case, uh, progressive childhood mitochondrial encephalopathy, damaging uh, the brain stem and the basal ganglia, with developmental delay, hypotonia, ophthalmoplegia, nystagmus, ataxia and other symptoms. It is absolutely normal. So, if you ask me, I would give us Histopathology alone, no diagnostic pathology. It's absolutely normal looking. So not all mitochondrial diseases show ragged red fibers or ragged blue fibers on biopsy. This has to be remembered. In such cases, mitochondrial assays and genetic studies are required. So it is, we cannot tell that histopathology will be the answer to everything. We cannot give you a 100% diagnosis all the time. Four year old with multiple mutilating ulcers on fingers and toes and cell destructive behavior. Myelin uh, stain showed normal density of fibers. Again, histopathology would be no diagnostic pathology, but clinically HSAN. Can this happen? Yes, because HSAN mainly has unmyelinated fiber loss. So we were looking at the myelinated fiber loss. So unmyelinated fiber loss cannot be recognized on routine histopathology. So it requires a mission and EM. So that is where we actually tell no diagnostic pathology and you may be telling no there is. So this is where we will not be able to give you a definitive uh, diagnosis. The other 54 year old diabetic with progressive limb weakness, NCS shows demyelinating neuropathy. Now if you see the epineurium there is inflammation here. The features, there are features of diabetic uh, microangiopathic changes like hyalinized vessels in the endoneurium. And on KPA, you are seeing thinly myelinated fibers. If you compare the diameter, uh, some of these have very thin uh, black ring. So they are thinly myelinated fibers. So histopathology wise, chronic demyelinating neuropathy in a background of diabetic neuropathy. Now, usual dilemma is, either, is it CIDP or is it diabetic neuropathy? This is the most common dilemma that comes. So if you ask me, can it be CIDP? Yes, because there is chronic demyelinating neuropathy. Remember, inflammation was in the epineurium and not in the endoneurium. 
As long as it's not in the endoneurium, we cannot call it as chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy. It has to be in the endoneurium. In the perineurium, it can be like a standby effect. The presence of inflammation need not always mean there is a pathology. Can it be diabetic neuropathy alone? Yes, it still can be. So, diabetic neuropathy can have varied features on histopathology ranging from just pure axonal to marked the demyelinating pathology. CSF protein levels are essential for us to know before uh, we call this as CIDP. Marked elevation in CSF and not just mild, they tell even uh, mild uh, uh, elevation in protein, CSF protein can even occur in diabetes. So, it has to be a marked elevation in the CSF for us to actually favor CIDP. Next, 30 year old uh, with clinical features of FSHD, again normal looking. Histopathology, again no diagnostic pathology. Can it be still FSHD? Absolutely. FSHD can show normal histology, subtle myopathic changes, florid myopathic changes, neurogenic features with or without inflammation. So, clinical correlation is a must in such cases to arrive at a right diagnosis. The only thing we can help you out is if you give us a history and tell can it be FSHD, we can add a comment that with clinical uh, correlation, this still is compatible with your FSHD diagnosis. So coming to the second point of what you expect out of us, that would be the uh, early, early reporting. Right? So normally we require at least 5 to 7 days because the processing is different. The nerve has uh, additional k part which is processed entirely differently. So if the slides come one day later, so at least five to seven days, that is the max. Unless it's a complicated case where we require more history, more investigation, there are more additional tests for that matter, where there can be delay in the cases. So the final take home message would be complete clinical history is essential for the neuropathologist to provide you a more definitive diagnosis Communication is a must because it's for us too. Communication is a must before we sign out or label a biopsy anything. So take your phone, call your clinical or the neuropathology colleague. Any atypical finding you let us know. We will let you know can anything be done for it. And remember it's always teamwork which helps us getting the right diagnosis to the right patient at the right time. So it, there is nothing called it's my work or your work. We are always a team to treat the patient. Uh, before I wind up, I just want to tell what are the neuropathology services available at First Neuro presently. Uh, uh, we do nerve biopsy interpretation, fixed muscle biopsy interpretation and tumor tissue analysis. But we'll be uh, starting soon the processing of fresh muscle uh, biopsies along with uh, inside histochemistry and IHC for dystrophin, uh, 1, 2, 3 which uh, corresponds to rod domain, the amino acid domain and the central domain. Alpha sarcoglycans, beta sarcoglycans, delta sarcoglycans and the gamma uh, sarcoglycans part of LGMDs as well as the dysferlin and emirin. Also IHC for common glial and glioneuronal tumors, pituitary panel, basic metastatic panel, basic lymphoma panel and uh, any other IHCs for the common tumors. Also starting ANA profile uh, via the immunofluorescence as well as the immunoblot, ANCA via the immunofluorescence. Inflammatory myositis antibody profiling via immunoglot and autoimmune encephalitis panel via the immunofluorescence. Thank you.